Amen. All right. Acts 15. This is the pivotal event in the book of Acts. I, I keep saying, like, oh, this is the pivotal event. But no, this one is. Uh, I promise, and I won't say it again, the rest of the book of Acts till next week. Okay, but the first 12 chapters kind of are a run-up to chapter 13, which is a pivotal event. The Holy Spirit kind of comes down on the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit's come on Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Acts chapter 8. Uh, it's kind of moving out from Jerusalem. In Acts 8, we're introduced to this guy, Philip. Philip goes down to Samaria, and the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit. It goes so well that Peter and John have to go down to check it out, and they're like, oh, this is legit. Then Philip goes and meets this Ethiopian finance minister, and he leads him to Christ. Boom, there's water on the side of the road. Do you want to get baptized? Boom, into the water, and like a Baptist, all the way down into the water they go. Acts chapter 9, another conversion, Saul who's the apostle Paul, he's out to murder Christians, and Jesus is like, enough of that, so you're going to stop murdering them. He ends up getting baptized by the people he was trying to kill. He ends up writing 13 books of the New Testament. He's kind of an important guy. That's a surprising conversion. Then you've got Acts 11, this major shift where these Gentiles are starting to come to faith in Christ through unknown missionaries. And then you've got the multicultural church of Antioch, where they eventually invite Saul, their persecutor, to be their pastor. Man, there's a lot going on. So throughout the book, you have these non-Jews who are begin trusting the Messiah. Paul and Barnabas have now gone out on this missionary journey, and they've got stories. People who have no Jewish background have come to faith in Christ. And at the end of Acts chapter 14, it says they've come back to Antioch. There's celebration, and then, and then they stayed there for a long time. So this is the run-up to Acts chapter 15. It's a huge dispute. It plays out now in this entire chapter. It's a watershed moment. Let me tell you how important it is. When I taught high school and college classes, if I was uh, teaching that class, I would say, this is the most important meeting of the New Testament. I promise. If I was teaching a semester-long course, I would spend one week on Acts chapter 15. It's about... What is the gospel? What is the faith? What is the role of the Old Testament law? How are we supposed to relate to one another? I mean, it's so important that an entire book of the Bible is about this issue, the book of Galatians. So Paul and Barnabas come back from their missionary journey. They stay for a while in chapter 14. Certain people then come up in Acts 15, chapter 1. They're teaching something that Paul has not taught. It actually gets into the churches that he just went to, and he's so beside himself, he actually writes Galatians. It's the only letter he doesn't greet people. He's so mad, he just gets right to the point. He's like, you're anathema, and you're anathema. He's like handing out anathema cards to everybody, and this person is under God's curse. He's totally upset. They're abandoning the gospel. And then Acts 15.1. So that's where we're at. This great missionary journey, Galatians being written, lots of frustration, and I want to show you what the issue is for them, and the issue is for us. And I want to show you the resolution for them, and the resolution for us. Okay, what's the issue? The issue is this, what is the gospel? It's kind of important, right? So, verse 1 and 2, certain men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute. So there are people from Judea. This is actually described in Galatians 2, 11 to 14. They call them certain men from James. So they're from Jerusalem. They're not authorized to go out. We find out later. They travel 335 miles to make a theological point by foot. You understand the personality of these people, right? Who walks 335 miles just to make the point? These guys. So there is multiple groups in Jerusalem. There are Orthodox Jews who don't want anything to do with Christians. There are Jews who are okay with the Christians. 
but aren't Christians. Then there are Jews who have converted to Christianity, who observe the Old Testament law. And then there are Gentiles who are the God-fearers, and they have practiced parts of the Old Testament law. So when they come to faith in Christ, no big change. But now there's this new group they don't know what to do with. These Gentiles who've never read a Bible. These Gentiles who don't know anything other than Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. These Gentiles whom Paul did not quote the Bible to, and they've converted, and now this issue arises, should we circumcise them? Now, that sounds kind of weird, right? It's a 2,000 year in the making argument, but for Paul, this issue is life and death. He is willing to die on this hill. I'm sure the adult males who are Gentiles are like, die on this hill, brother, okay? So Paul is a successful missionary, successful missionary, and he's willing to drop everything in his success to go down to Jerusalem or up to Jerusalem to figure this issue out. Now, Paul must be having flashbacks because Galatians 2, 1 through 10, and he writes about this, he's already been to Jerusalem. He's already argued about this. The church has already been okay with it. But here we go again. Now, have you ever read the New Testament and wondered, like, why do we have to learn about this super uncomfortable, awkward, private thing called circumcision. Like, if you don't have a Christian background and you read your Bible, you're just like, wow, they talk a lot about circumcision in the New Testament. It's in kids' coloring books. It's in your Bible studies. We talk about it like it's, it's, just, it's just something we always talk about. Is there any place else in culture that just talks about circumcision publicly? I'm just trying to make you feel just more and more awkward as we go, okay? (laughs) This isn't the issue in Jerusalem. This isn't the issue in Galatia. This is the issue. The book of Galatians is this issue. Romans 2, Romans 3, Romans 4, it's this issue. Philippians 3, this issue. 1 Corinthians 7, this issue. The book of Acts, this issue. It just keeps coming up. Remember the run-up, okay? Acts 11, Peter gets criticized by the circumcision party because he, uh, has, uh, he goes into the house of a Gentile. Acts 15, Paul is opposed by the circumcision party. Galatians 2, 1 through 10, Paul is opposed by the circumcision party. Galatians 2, 11 through 14, Peter and Barnabas get caught up with the circumcision party. You better have a handle on what circumcision is if you're gonna understand the New Testament. You're welcome, parents. <laughs> Kids, ask your mom and dad. So circumcision is a sign that the Jews belong to God. It is a covenant ceremony. It is a cutting ceremony with blood. That's what it means to ratify a covenant. You, you make a covenant by cutting. That's what covenant is, berit, covenant, or cut. And so, from Abraham, God's people are marked out by this one thing, circumcision. So it's a sign you belong to God's people. It makes perfect sense for these Jewish believers. Of course, they must be Jewish. So Jesus, the the argument is Jesus' death is important. It, it has importance. It, it, it is the way in which God's grace comes out. But you must also become Jew. You Jewish proselytes who know nothing, you must become like us. That's essentially the issue. And it's huge because in the end, it's about Jesus. What does it mean that Jesus died on the cross? Now, before the first missionary journey, this isn't an issue, really. I mean, it kind of is, but it's not an issue because there's not a lot of Gentiles who have zero background with Jews who are converted. But now these people are converted and are like, "Uh uh-oh, what are we supposed to do with these guys? And so they're willing, Paul is willing to die on this hill. He comes into sharp debate with Barnabas, with these Jews who've come up to Antioch. And I just say to us, is there any theological hill you're willing to die on? 
I'm guessing in our church, we do not have people who are willing to die on every hill. We're kind of a broad evangelical church. We have people from lots of denominational backgrounds. We celebrate that. So it's not that, hey, man, I'm going to die on every hill and everyone hates you because every hill is a battle. I'm talking about any hill. Is there anything you're willing to just drop everything you're doing like the Apostle Paul and be like, no, I'm going to Jerusalem. We're walking 335 miles. We're going to figure this out. That's what happens. And so verse 3, they get sent out. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told the Gentiles had been converted, and the news made all the believers glad. So the church of Antioch decides, we can't solve this here. This is too big of an issue. These guys came from Jerusalem. Isn't that the mother church? We got to send people down. And as they go down, they start telling stories, and it makes the believers happy. Now, there's a principle here, and I think it's this, is that there is... You know, Acts is highlight real Christianity. Big event, big event, big event, big event. And every once in a while, you get the in-between time, the in-between moments. And here, Paul and Barnabas don't use that time to throw the Christians under the bus in Jerusalem. All they do is use the time to make people glad by telling them what God has done. Travel time. And I'm loathe to give examples from my own life of this, but I'm... I'm going to loathe myself the rest of the day and tell you one. I had a friend, Eric Terhune, dies in Afghanistan uh, serving our country. I find out in Buffalo, New York. I, I mean, Amy and I are close with Eric. And I, we ended up, I said, okay, I'm going to go to the funeral. I, I go down. I, weird connecting flight. I just want to be left alone on this flight. But the seat in front of me is broken on this flight of like 22 seats. And wouldn't you know it, the seat next to me is open. And so here comes this woman down the thing. The seat's broken. This is her seat. What is she going to do? Her and the flight attendant, yip, 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 yip. I'm like, ah, just sit here. There's no one here. She sits down. We start talking. I got one hour. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. No one's canceling headphones. But she starts talking. She's, uh, you know, the stepmom of a country singer, married, married to a former Major League Baseball player who died. And then she says, and then these people have been telling me about Jesus. And I'm like, number seven, I haven't said anything yet. And I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. You know, so I start talking to her. And on the plane, she comes to Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, what just happened? I was home. I had no plans to do anything in between. And I was going to go to a funeral. Those are the highlights. And in the in-between time, God did something. That's what Paul and Barnabas are doing here. There's an in-between time between these major events, and they use it to encourage the saints. Amazing. Okay, back to the text. They rejoice. Essentially what that means is they're totally fine with the Gentiles coming to faith, which is a pretty big deal because they're saying, you know what, it's totally fine that that they're into the community of faith. And so this debate ensues. They get into the church. Okay, now they're in Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas are there, and there are other people there. You've got the mother church. You've got the elders. You've got the apostles, and you've got the church. And they start talking, and verse 5, it says this. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So Paul and Barnabas have been going up to Jerusalem, and the whole time they've been making people glad, and then they tell the same stories, and they get protested. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 5, and I'll be honest, you should underline, circle, highlight this, and think through this a lot, because this, is, this drives, has driven me crazy thinking about this. Then some of the believers... So the teaching, which, is, which are at odds with Paul and Barnabas, is coming from believers. Luke doesn't anathematize them. He doesn't say, you're out of the church. The Jerusalem church lets them be part of the church. And they're, in essence, denying the gospel. And Luke says, believers they're sincere. They're not trying to pick people off. It's just they're confused. You know, sometimes your background gets you in trouble, right? Like the thing that you were before you became a Christian, 
kind of impacts how you view Jesus? These are Pharisees. These are men who studied the scripture. These are men who would have been leaders in the, uh, in the Jerusalem. They loved the law. They loved the customs. And if coming to Christ probably meant they lost their family, probably meant they lost their position, and now they're in the church, and they've imported what they used to believe into the church, and it's causing problems. And the church, and Luke in particular says, they're believers. I just say that because of the patience of the early church. This is roughly 15 years after Jesus, and we're talking about the people who knew him, some of them who walked with him for three years, some of them who were with him, some who studied with him, saw the resurrection. That's the church in Jerusalem. And 15 years later, they're still working out the implications of the gospel. They still haven't quite got it. I just say that because there's things in every culture that come up, right, that make us have to think through and the church has to respond. And Christians are so quick to say, not a believer, not a believer, 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 on things the church has never had to think about before. These people have never had to think about this issue. We've been thinking about this issue for 2,000 years, and I'm still not sure what Acts 15 is about in some, some ways. These guys, this is brand new stuff. What does the law have to do with these Gentiles? What is the thing that we cherish the most? Circumcision, which marks us off from the nations for all of our history. What does that have to do now with Jesus? And look at the church, verse 6. They're, this is a debate. They're discussing it together. They're doing Bible study. Also, verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. In other words, this isn't one person standing on his perch being like, I'm going to go into my room, and I'm going to figure out what it says. I'm going to come back out here, and I'm going to tell you. That's not what this is. This is, let's all get together and sit in a circle and figure this out because we're not sure. That's the issue. What is the gospel? Now, here's resolution one. The gospel removes burdens, verse 7 through 9. So Peter stands up, which means he was sitting. I mean, it's just like a little side thing. But you can pick, you, if you picture the room, this isn't like, you know, 50 people standing in a room. They're all sitting down. Peter's sitting there. And we all know Peter, right? Like, I can't believe he waited. <laughs> the debate's gone on. He decides to speak up. Let's read what he says. Brothers. You know, for some time, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit as he did for us. He did not discriminate between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we or our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus we are saved just as they are. So Peter claims special privilege. He is not the first one that went to the Gentiles. There were unnamed missionaries that went up to Antioch. But here's Peter, and he says, Hey, guys, do you remember what happened? So he's referring back to Acts chapter 10. He, we've already done this debate. Peter is saying, Acts 10, let me just read. So he goes into the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, and he looks at him and he says this, I realize that God does not show favoritism. This is Acts 10, 34. God does not show favoritism, but accepts them from every nation and the one who fears and does what is right. So Peter recounts to the church, hey, guys, don't you remember what happened? That's Acts 11. He comes into the church. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, what happens? The circumcision believer, circumcised believers criticized him. You went into the house of an uncircumcised man, and you ate with him. And starting with the beginning, Peter told the whole story. And how does that story end? Verse 18, when they heard this, there was no further objections, and they praised God. So then even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance. So Peter is saying this, hey, guys. We've already done this. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? We've already had this debate. Don't you remember? I, I told you what happened, and you rejoiced. Why are you arguing? 
Cornelius' family received the Holy Spirit just like we did. I saw it happen. I told you it happened. And you did this. Why are we here? Why are people out there saying circumcision is required? Why can't you just remember? Now, that event was 10 years before this. This is about 48 AD, so that's about 38 AD. Peter says, hey, by our experience, this is all about grace. Why are we having this debate? Now, if I wanted to stick it to Peter, and I'm going to stick it to Peter, I might say, hey, Peter, you didn't learn the lesson either. Because if you read in Galatians 2, 11 through 14, which happens right essentially between the last verse of Acts 14 and the end of Acts 15, 1, Peter goes up to Antioch, and the circumcised party comes up there, and here's what it says. Paul tells everyone for all the world to hear for all eternity When Cephas came up to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For certain men came from James, so that's Acts 15, 1, now in Galatians 2. And he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of the circumcision group. I mean, is Peter afraid of anything in Scripture? He's afraid of this group. And other Jews joined him so that even in hypocrisy, Barnabas was led astray. So Peter is yelling, at the, is yelling in Acts 15 at these people, hey, don't you remember what happened? And Paul could have been in his head thinking, don't you remember what happened last week? We forget so quickly. You know, if there's one word that gets repeated a lot in Scripture, it's this word, remember, remember, remember. Remember, remember. Why? Because we forget, forget, forget. Any of you had little kids? And you're just like, I told you to do that. I don't know what you're talking about. Let me remind you, remind you, remind you. You know, at the end of Peter's life, he writes this in his last words in 2 Peter. This is chapter 1. I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established. That is Peter's job And really, I think my job in some ways is just to tell you what you already know. That you and I can go walking through life, Christian, I'm talking to Christians in particular, and you could have a track record of God doing things for you, and one thing could happen, and you could crumble and fall on your face. What is that? What is that? Like 20 years of God doing work in your life, and you're like, cancer diagnosis, crumble, God doesn't like me. Uh, Kid off the rails. Forget all that stuff before. Job, you get fired. You get an F as a grade. And you're just like, all these things that God has done, you just forget. That's what Paul, that's what Peter's saying. Guys, we've done this. What is wrong with you? We've done this. Remember. Now, Peter's kind of strong here. What's the attitude in verse 10? They're testing God. That's not good. (laughs) Anytime someone tells you you're testing God, that's not good. Satan tested God, didn't go well for him. Ananias and Sapphira tested God, didn't go well for them. Israelites tested God, didn't go well for them. If you're testing God, you're saying, I'm against you. He tests us. We don't test him. And what is the test? They are putting a yoke on Gentiles they could not bear themselves. Now, what the heck is that yoke? I'll just say, if you're visiting here, We're just doing deep dive into the Bible, and if you're used to, like, kind of big summary fluff stuff, you're going to be totally lost. And you know what? I kind of get lost, because this is really tough. Let's look at the text. Back to it. Verse 10. They're putting a yoke, I have no apologies, on the Gentiles they could not bear. What is that? It is a complicated mess. That's what that is. Denominations, theologians, commentaries, they are not in agreement on this all totally okay so the yoke is the law peter is saying in some way the appear the coming of jesus has superseded the old testament law and i i'm just going to gloss over this if you are into deeper bible study you know that the law and the christian is a complex issue right now acts 15 they're settling that issue does it feel settled to you You want to do a Bible study on, let's just have the elders come up here and say, hey, each of you explain the law and the Christian in two minutes. We'll see how much agreement we get. I'm not going to do that. 
There's a long history of Christian interpretation that says the law is here, the gospel is here. But Israel didn't see the, the law as a burden. They saw it as a privilege. Paul calls the law holy. Jesus says he doesn't come to abolish the law. So what is going on? Peter is saying that the Jews never managed the law themselves. So why in the world would they give it to the Gentiles? What, what is he talking about? Is he saying, well, we should not expect them to follow honor your parents. We shouldn't expect them to follow don't murder. Is that what he's saying? Like the Ten Commandments are out? Or are there other things? Are these things that separate the Jews from everyone else? The food laws, circumcision, rituals. It could be a lot of different things. Notice that Peter doesn't tell the Jews to abandon the law. He doesn't say to the Jewish Christians, it's out for you. He doesn't say to the Jewish Christians, Circum you don't have to stop doing circumcision. It's only for the Gentiles. Now, this line is almost identical to what Paul says in Acts 13. I'm going to read them back to back. Tell me if you hear the exact same thing. Here's Peter. Why do you try to test God by putting the necks on the Gentiles, a yoke that we could not bear? Or ancestors, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus we are saved. Now, here's Paul in his sermon in Acts 13. See if it sounds familiar. I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin, a justification you're not able to receive from the law of Moses. So Paul and Peter are preaching essentially the same thing. And so why do I say, hey, the gospel is removing burdens? Because if I could cut through this whole thing, it's this. Peter is saying, bottom line, we believe we're saved by grace. We believe they're saved by grace. So why are we making them do stuff if we say they're saved by grace? God is the initiator, he's saying, of salvation. He has sent Jesus. Jesus is the source of our salvation. And that all comes to us by faith, not by circumcision. That's what he's saying. Now, how does he remove burdens? Jesus uses almost the exact same language. You may have memorized this verse one time in your life. Come to me, all who are weary, and some of your versions say heavy laden. Some of you say burdened, and I will give you rest. How does that go? Take my Yoke upon yourself and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's certainly one way to describe the gospel, that the standard is grace. Now, there are other things that we tend to do to make it not grace, right? Do you find yourself pushing your preferences on anyone? I mean, the church has a great history of pushing preferences on people by appearance, skin color, jobs, cultural practices, car choices, what you do with your money. I mean, we are so dissatisfied with other people and what they do, right? It makes us a judge. It makes us bitter. Why is the church so messed up on this? Well... The church is the only place in the world where you have to admit duplicity to get in. It's the only place you admit guilt. And here the specific demands from the Jewish Christians are you must be circumcised. The Christians from the inside are not understanding the gospel. The people who are with the apostles, the people who know Peter, the people who have seen miracles, the people who've seen the Holy Spirit come down, who've been told many, many times, look at the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ, and they're still saying, but you must do something else. It is Jesus plus this stuff. Now, we don't do that anymore, right? Circumcision. We don't say, you've got to be circumcised. We do other things. In churches, gifts of the Spirit, voting patterns, certain lifestyles, choices. I mean, for a hundred years, missionaries went to Africa and changed those clothing styles in order to make them Christian. What are we talking about? We're talking about this, adding to the gospel. What is the gospel? It is the burden remover. And look how Paul and Barnabas now bring it home. The whole assembly became silent. That's... Not always happens in churches. They become silent as they listen to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles. So when the silent hits, Peter's words land, and Paul and Barnabas don't do theological arguments. They do experience arguments with theological underpinnings. Hey, 
We went on this missionary trip. Sergius Paulus came to Christ, and we blinded the Jewish sorcerer. Then we went up to Iconium. Then we went to Lystra. We were signs and wonders in Iconium. Then we went over to Lystra, and we healed a blind guy. Then these people tried to worship us, and we said no. And then they stoned Paul. Then we went back through and taught him stuff. Now we're back in Antioch. And it drives the message home, missionary stories. I mean, imagine for a second this was the argument in our church. Muslims cannot be Christians from the Middle East unless they become American citizens. Muslims from the Middle East cannot be Christians unless they become Muslim citizens. This is what I would do to argue that. I would say, let me introduce you to my friend Sahar who tried to commit suicide. And then cried and messed it up and got on a bus and walked out of the bus and there was a church and she got into a Bible study. And then Jesus came to her in her room in a dream and said, Sahar, I've told you the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me and was gone. And Sahar believed. That's how I would argue against you. I would say, I have a friend. She was a terrible Afghan refugee, horrible person. They were going to kick her out of the refugee center one day. Totally different. Afghan woman. What happened? I was outside the door. This man in white came up to me. I said, the door is locked. He said, the door is open. I said, the door is locked. The man said, I am the door and was gone. Hey, was that Jesus? These are, I would tell you these stories. This is what Paul and Barnabas are doing. Let me tell you. Let's do story time. Peter's done theology time. I'm doing story time. Without grace, you just become a church that questions everybody, and that's exhausting, right? You're just always questioning someone else's salvation, always questioning someone else. Okay, last thing. The gospel allows for flexibility. I'm just going to do this quickly. I guess I'll do it next week. <laughs> James stands up to speak, and he essentially lays down two principles. He quotes Amos. The, the Jews and Gentiles are now under David's fallen tent. He quotes, here's something crazy. He quotes the Greek, not the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew Old Testament, as if to say, these Greeks are with us. In Jerusalem, he's quoting the Greek New Te Old Testament. His arguments are simple. For those under grace, we don't give you any requirements other than the gospel. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles turning to God. This is James, the brother of Jesus, not an apostle. He seems to be the elder of the church. In other words, James' words are, people are turning to God. They've made a heavy price. They've said their idols aren't true. They've given up their lifestyle. Why are we doing this? And then for those under grace, there are restrictions. Instead, we're going to write them. Tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, meat strangled from animals, and from blood. Honestly, there are like 30 interpretations. Why these four? You just said, we're not going to make you do anything, and then they list four things. Now, three of them make sense. Food polluted by idols, meat strangled by animals, and blood. The Jews have sensitivity on these issues, and he's telling the Gentiles, if you, we, for the sake of unity, don't do this. Why sexual immorality on this list? It could be a lot of things. I think personally, this is a list from Leviticus 17 and 18. This list follows Leviticus 17 and 18 perfectly. It's rules for Gentiles who are living in the land of Israel as aliens, and he's applying those laws now to the Gentiles who are amongst the Jewish believers. So he's not actually against the law. He's actually applying the law in a new way because Jesus has come. This is why I'm not a Lutheran in terms of law and gospel. I know this is like into the thick of it, but for real, th this is like the issue in Acts 15. This is, this is what they're doing. They're arguing about the core issue, and they're going down deep, quoting the Old Testament law, using it as a way to explain what's going on, saying that they don't have to be circumcised anymore, but the Jews, you can keep doing it. And all for what reason? Verse 21, for the law of Moses has been preached every city from the earliest times and read in the synagogues. I think what that means is there are going to be synagogues everywhere Gentile Christians are. Therefore, do these things for the sake of the Jewish Christians. Don't eat that meat that is from the pagan temples. 
Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9. I am free as long to, as to everyone, but I've made my slave, myself a slave. For those who are under the law, I made myself under the law. For those who are not under the law, I acted as if I wasn't under the law. For the sake of mission, they have some flexibility. Now, these aren't universal. We could write them, rewrite them in every generation. But what's the result? Verse 30. This is after the letter gets written. So they sent them off to Antioch, they gathered the church, the people read it, and they were glad. Now, would you be rejoicing if at the end of this they said, just burn your steak for the sake of others? That's what they're being told. Don't eat food with blood. Would you be willing to give something up? We're, we're, we're a culture that prizes not giving anything up. If you take something from me, you've ruined my life. They're willing to burn steak for the sake of the gospel. So the Jerusalem Council, council settles the issue. It's going to be grace alone. It's going to be Jesus plus nothing. It's going to be Jesus. And for the sake of mission, it's going to mean I am willing to restrict myself for the sake of others because God has removed every burden from me. That's the call. All right, let's pray. Father, as we move into a time of communion, we just ask that you would please, please, please make us people on mission who are willing to restrict ourselves for the sake of others, who, who come under the laws for the sake of mission. And may we never add to the gospel. May we never make it Jesus plus anything. Whatever lists are in our minds, that we use to place ourselves over, over others, would you remove those now as we come together at your table? Amen.